Question 1. The total cost of manufacturing electronic components is represented by a straight line graph that we can see here. Calculate the gradient of the straight line graph. Gradient is given by the change in y over the change in x. This is sometimes written as y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2. So let's choose some points on our graph. Some people find it helpful to draw a triangle for their points. I'm going to choose this point and this point here. If I was doing a less if I was using a less precise graph, picking points that are further apart can give me a more reliable measure of the gradient. But this graph is quite precise, so it probably wouldn't make a difference. But I'm sort of in the habit anyway. Okay, so on top we've got the y values, those are the vertical axis, and I've got a value, if I use my ruler to make sure I don't misread the axis, just here. 25, 30, so that's 5 spaces, 5 numbers, so that's 27. So my first value is 27. And this value down here, that's 3. So 27 minus 3 gives me the change in y. To get my change in x, that first point that gave me the 27 will be the first point that gives me a 6. And this point is actually 0. Simplify. 24 over 6, which itself equals 4. So, I found the gradient, and the gradient is equal to 4. I'm now asked, in part 2, to find the equation of the straight line. The first thing I'm going to do is write down the format y equals mx plus c. Even knowing that might be enough for a mark sometimes, if you write it down. So let's have a look at what we've got. y, that's our vertical axis. And that's tc, total cost. Okay, so tc. m is the gradient. I've got that here, so that's 4. And x is whatever's on the horizontal axis, which the symbol is n. c, I was about to put the plus in, but it might be negative, so I'll wait. It isn't, though, is it? The line hits the y-axis at 3. So positive 3, so I can put the plus in after all. tc equals 4n plus 3. Question 2. A transmission tower is viewed from point A. So here's point A. This must be the transmission tower. The transmission tower must be 32 metres tall. Calculate the distance from point A to the base of the tower at point B. That's what I'm after. There's a right angle. So it's a right angle triangle. It's Sokotoa. This is the opposite. This is the adjacent, and this is the hypotenuse. The opposite, yes, I've got that. The hypotenuse, no. The adjacent, yes. The, op the hypotenuse, no. The opposite and the adjacent. I want tan of the angle. Tan of 28 degrees is equal to the opposite, which is 32, over the adjacent, which I don't know, but it's called AB. That's my substitution. The first mark was for identifying that it's tan. My working here shows me that. Second mark for substitution. The third mark is for the rearrangement. There's two stages to this rearrangement. I can multiply both sides by the length AB which gives me this, and then I can divide both sides by tan 28 to give me AB equals 32 over tan 28 degrees. 
Now that needs to go in my calculator. 32 tan 28. Make sure that I'm in degrees. And there we've got an answer. 60.183. Not exactly, but I'm just stopping there, because when I give my final answer on the answer line, I'm going to round and I'm going to say 60.2 metres, sorry, not degrees. Question three. A plumb bob is manufactured as a casting. And we can see the plumb bob here. Cone on top, hemisphere on the bottom. This is the radius of both the hemisphere and also the radius of the base of the cone as well. Here's the perpendicular height of the cone. Calculate the volume of the cone section of the plumb bob. So we just asked for the cone section. So we can completely ignore the hemisphere. Very kind of them. So the volume of a cone is equal to one third pi r squared h. Substituting, well, one third and pi, they're not substitutes, they're just there as they come, r, the radius here, is 20. And the perpendicular height of the cone is 100. Putting that into our calculator, I get 41,887 and so on. Now in fact, I've usually been round to three different figures. But since this is five digits, it's kind of nice to go to the nearest hole. But to do that, let's include the first decimal place of 9. Now, when I round my answer, I'm going to have 41,888. And that's going to be millimetres cubed to five significant figures. I decided to go for five significant figures because that took me all the way down to like a whole number of for a whole number of millimeter cubes. And just for the sake of the extra two, it's nice to have the whole number. Question four. The percentage increase of an amplifier is represented by the equation PI, percentage increase is a percentage, equals Y cubed T all squared with a square outside the brackets. Solve the equation to find the value of y when the percentage increase is 64 and the value of t equals 2. Show evidence of the rules of indices. Now, let's start out. I've got pi as a percentage, that's a really nasty symbol having all those bits there, equals brackets y cubed t close brackets squared. I'm going to start by substituting to make this a bit less of a mess. pi is 64. y cubed, or y we don't know, so y cubed stays as it is. T is 2, and that's all being squared. Now, this time is by 2. I'm going to rewrite that. I've put that 2 as a coefficient. I put it in front. It's just a bit neater. Now, the first thought I had was, well, this is being squared. And this is a square number, so I could just square root both sides. Then I would get, well, the square root of 64 is 8, so I'd get 8 equals 2y cubed. 
but then where am I going to show any index rules? I mean, that might be a valid way of doing it, but it might not show what they want me to. So instead, since I'm looking to demonstrate the rules of indices, I'm going to make this two apply to what's inside the brackets. Still all equal to 64. So a lot of people know that this y with the power of 3, I'll multiply that. That's using one of my index laws. But people forget that the 2 also has the 2 applied to it. So this 2 is being squared, just like this 3 is being times by 2. Tidying that up, I get 4y to the power 6. Now I'm going to divide both sides by 4 to get 16y to the power 6. And now I'm going to do something you might not have seen before. If this was squared or cubed, you could square root or cube root it. I'm going to apply the sixth root. Now you might not have done higher roots like this before, and we wouldn't have had to if we just dealt with that squared at the beginning like I wanted to, but we're playing their game. So how do we enter that on the calculator? Because that will just give us the answer for y. So, I've got my square root button there, and if I use shift above it, I've got my cube root. But over here, above the any power button, I've got this one here. If I put shift, and I can enter whatever roots I want. And now to make it look like it appears on the page. And there we have it. 1.5874. Etc. So I'm going to move to the bottom of the page with the answer boxes, and my final answer for y will be y equals 1.59. Now we're not given any units for y, um, so we don't have to worry about that, but we still should say how we've rounded it. Question 5. A ship sails at 6 metres per second in a straight line. The wind is blowing at 2 metres per second at right angles to the direction the ship is travelling in. Draw an accurate vector diagram to represent, to represent the resultant velocity of the ship. Now there's a couple of different ways we can represent this. The main thing is, I need to pick a consistent scale for both directions. Unlike a graph, I can't scale my axes differently. They have to be scaled the same. So let's start out with 6 A 6 centimeter line representing this 6 meters per second. I'm going to put an arrow on that to show that I mean 6 this way. Now some of you might be wondering, but it doesn't specify the direction, it just says 6. And that means that I could have picked any direction, but this 2 meters per second, this 2 meters per second is at right angles to that. So the requirement is, whatever direction I picked for the ship's power, its velocity going forward, the wind needs to be at 90 degrees to that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show both of those acting on the same point. As if both of those are acting on a ship here. Now the resultant of this would be that. And when I show you the alternative way of laying this out in a moment, you might be able to see why. But first I'm going to label this. I'm going to call this velocity with a subscript of W for wind. And this is going to be a velocity with a subscript of S for sailing. 
and this will be velocity with a subscript of r for resultant. And that will be enough to get me four marks. I have not been asked to work out the length of this. If I was, I could use Pythagoras, 2 squared, 6 squared, add them and then square root, but I haven't been asked to. I have not been asked to work out the direction of travel. I could work that out by finding this angle here. If I wanted to do that, I would need to use some Sokotoa, since these are at 90 degrees to each other. I'll talk more about that when I've shown the alternative layout. But remember, this is enough for full marks. I'm now going to show you an alternative. I could have rearranged the vectors in a way that's usually described as nose to tail. This vector down here that's acting on the same point, the ship, I could take it and add it onto the end of this vector. This is part of the triangle law of vector addition. This one gets added on up here. And that might make it clearer why the resultant velocity is as we drew it the first time. Because it's the shortcut of going from here to here to here is the same as going here. Now, I would need to label this up just the same. Of course, now the wind velocity is up top. And hopefully you can see now, if I wanted to work out this angle, which I've not been asked in this question, but just in case it comes up in the exam, I could, I've got this opposite here, I've got this adjacent here, I'd need to use tan and I could work it out. But I've not been asked to.